Welcome to the Stories or Soul Food podcast with your hosts, Brian Cole and best selling author, N.D. Wilson. This audio is brought to you by Cannonball Books and Great Homeschool Conventions. Welcome to episode seven of the Stories Are Soul Food podcast. We're here with uh, guest Forrest Dickinson, illustrator, animator, landscape painter. What else? What do we describe? Father? Fan of clouds. Fan. Cloud of, fan. Of clouds. Hello. Welcome, Forrest. <laughs> Good Welcome to be here. to Stories Are Soul Food. We are going to be talking about graphic novels, are we not? Yeah, that's the plan today. Okay. So, kick it off, Brian. What are we talking about with the graphic novel? I guess I'm approaching it as what is a graphic novel? Is it any different than a comic? A comic strip? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's longer and it tends to have, it's not just one gag. It's like one long story. So, it's basically, I think the, the closest thing to a graphic novel would be a film adapted into a comic book form. For all intents and purposes, it's just long form comics. Okay. Gotcha. So, you kind of agree. I think I read somewhere online that a graphic novel is basically the binding. That's the difference between it and a comic. The binding? The binding. If it's bound all together. <laughs> oh, you're, t- you're talking about comic books. Yeah, comic books. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So, the saddle stitched. Right. Like super cheap newsprint stapled, like a right. folded stapled, like old Spider-Man or Hulk comics. Or yeah. X-Men 134. Where do we anthologies go then? Like a Calvin and Hobbes anthology. I don't, I mean, I guess maybe your definition in the other one I read was that if it has a beginning, middle and end, then it would count as a graphic novel. If it doesn't, then it's a periodical, but I don't know. So, gra- a graphic novel is, I have assumed, just a three act story that is illustrated in comic form. If somebody actually did bind it saddle stitched, it wouldn't make it not a graphic novel. Where was this definition found? Well, I just was looking around trying to find out if they are in fact different or I was suspicious that it was just the publishing industry's attempt to make more money, which sure probably is. Probably is, but they are, know, and also now that, that they're now that they're pop yeah, now that they're popular, they are in form, they're changing a lot. There's a lot of different yeah. execution. So there's yeah. some that are just illustrated, more heavily illustrated chapter books, basically. Mm-hmm. Some that are comics in that you're talking about thought bubbles and yeah. speech bubbles and panels. Yeah. Um, and others that aren't that way at all. Yeah. So, you know, man, what was the book that really pushed people a few years ago? Um, Hugo Cabret, Invention of Hugo Cabret, where there was hundreds of pages in the middle of illustrations with no words. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, and it was prose, and then a big block of just, you know, full page illustrations that told the story, that picked up the story and carried it through. Mm-hmm. What was it called when they marketed it? The people were torn. They actually caused a little bit of a controversy, uh, at least when it came time for awards, because people loved it. So, was it an illustrated book? Was it eligible for the Newberry or was it eligible for the Calvicott? And gotcha. that was kind of the, the struggle. But that was back when people cared about rules. It actually kind of, it's, this is a totally different topic, but mm-hmm. it is now we live in a time when rules are bad, mm-hmm. like boundaries are bad. And so, seen by the industry and often by readers. So now the Newberry, which is a an endowed award for, and as a novelist, I take this very personally, endowed award for novels, right? For stories that are not specifically not dependent on illustration, right? Now they they have given that now I believe multiple times to graphic novels. Okay, have given the Newberry Award where previously the graphic novel would have been only eligible for the Caldecott, which is for the best book of the year, which is dependent upon illustrations, and so. Finding that binary really insulting, now awards committees don't give a rip what the awards are technically for. Right. You know, they just stick the seal on it. Because like the, the modern, I guess if we're talking modern graphic novels, wouldn't Mouse be one of the very first like Art Spiegelman's Mouse? It reminded me of what you talk, we talked about last episode where you were saying the reason you can talk about adult themes for children and everybody yeah. when you move the main so when you take world war ii and move it to mice yeah. and the bad guys the nazis as cats you're all of a sudden able to tell a story you wouldn't be able to tell and i was to wondering younger if, people to, yeah. to younger people and i was wondering if if graphic novels what you guys thought about graphic novels having what do they do why what what is it about pictures are we a less literate culture and so we like pictures more are graphic novels a sign of our degeneration? <laughs> <laughs> probably. Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. Probably. 
Yeah. But then why do we like them so much? Because I know my, my son, he's reading uh, Hazardous Tales and it's graphic novel historical adaptation. Yeah. The first one's about Nathan Hale getting yeah. hung and it, he loved it. And, it, you know, it's hard to get him to read a full book. He's working yeah. on it. But I think they, they can be really helpful. I've got no objection to them. They can be really helpful with a reluctant reader. Yeah. But the question is, do you get them past it? Right. And the sure. fact that they are a destination. And I really, I have no objection to them in genre or form. The question is just, does their dominance or does, as, as they consume more and more of the market share of publishing, is that a sign? Is that a bad sign of the culture overall? And I think it probably is, but it also is not the graphic novel's fault, nor is it the fault of the graphic novelists. So if Doritos suddenly start being eaten, you know, more than hamburgers. Like, <laughs> you know, okay. the culture is done. Yeah. yeah. It's like, okay, is, what is that a sign of? It's like, that doesn't mean the Doritos is evil, but the fact that Doritos are now consumed at a rate 100 times what they were 10 years ago, <laughs> that would be something that would, you know, comment on the nature of the culture. So I think the fact that graphic novels now really do consume a huge chunk of the market share there are a lot out there and there's a lot of excellent graphic novels out there. There's a lot of really fun graphic novels that I have absolutely nothing but praise for, but they're now taking the place of bigger, you know, bigger, more meaty projects. So I wouldn't be surprised if the next Harry Potter was a graphic novel series, you know, uh, something that just reached that level of dominance. And that would be strange. We, that would, that would be a mile marker when the best selling book of the year is a graphic novel. It will be a mile marker culturally. Yeah, Japan culturally has 15 issues of manga published per person per year in Japan. So it's like 1.9 billion and 15 per person on the island of Japan. I think, wow. I think that's reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> well Not done, too Japan. many Doritos. <laughs> it sounds like about right. 15 bags of Doritos per person. That's, with, that's within the margin of error <laughs> <laughs> for cultural health. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'd say, so you look at big, big series like Amulet that have spanned years and years and you look at obviously what like Doug Tenable's done. What he's done is a lot of really far-fetched weird. And that's kind of what he sees the graphic novel as accomplishing is some enables him to have flights of fantasy, fantasy and imagination that work with a comic book audience that wouldn't work in prose. So it's back in the day when I was, I think 2007, when I was first talking to animation producers who make like animated feature films in talking to them about concepts and ideas and what it was they wanted to pursue, they would always say, why must it be animated? They didn't want to make any movie that was an animated film unless it had to be animated. And I think that's kind of the graphic novel now would be a great way to approach it would be, I have a story. Why is this story better as a graphic novel than as prose? And there's stories where that could be absolutely the case. And that could also be the case for a particular artist. So like Forrest is an illustrator. So if you're looking at a story he wants to tell and he wants to create something, can like which, which medium is better? Uh, and if you could do a A++ graphic novel or do a B- minus prose novel <laughs> and you're looking at the two and saying, I think this, this is one I could do or this is one I could do, like, well, the choice is easier. If you're looking at, I could do an A++ prose novel or an A++ graphic novel, then you look at the reader and which will impact them more and which will re reach more people, feed more people, affect more people. And you make the choice there. But it is, it is really interesting because as awards go to graphic novels, as graphic novels are developed out ranging from Lunch Lady comics to Baby Mouse, and they're not really graphic novels, they're comics, but they have little through stories, you know, those little books. And my, my daughter loves those. And I'm not worried, you know, that I'm glad that she reads them. Yeah. Okay. So, turn it, Forrest, I guess, chime in there. Why would, what do you like about graphic novels or why would you choose a graphic novel? To, to create one? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, it's, it's back it up and say to read. Yeah. Why would I read one? <laughs> no, if you, if you look at one. Yeah. When you head to the library, which way would you go? Yeah. If you're, if you're going to make a choice, like what's the last graphic novel that pulled you away from a prose book? Man, it's a tough question because prose at this point in my life has been the majority of what I consume. But the last one that I was into that felt like I got the same or a similar level of immersion and world building and interest was Jeff Smith's. And in there, it was just his, the visual artistry was top shelf. So, it was- Still black and white though, right? For the yeah, black and white. Yeah. And I think that one, they did a color version, which I think ruined it a, little, a lot. <laughs> the, uh, He's a purist. <laughs> well, just for that one. I mean, 
Color is great. Is that is that adult or kid or is that what would you call that? Mm, middle grade, I'd say. I've read it too. Yeah. yeah. Very pen and ink style. Really kind of strange though, and one, right? Yeah, one that I wouldn't think anyone would tell in prose. Like we've got these characters that are actually bones. Yeah. And what what's the the hook there just if you're if you're hearing about it or reading about it, it seems like a weird sort of pointless jump to make versus like the visual you can see when they're drawn they have this nice visual appeal to them the roundness you, and yeah. smoothness <laughs> <and> coherence <laughs> of like a, lumpy uh, yeah. bone thing they sort of look like bones yeah this may talk about my reader comprehension i didn't realize they were bones actual bones <laughs> i thought they were just like kind of lumpy <laughs> balloon shapes i mean they're never it's never explicitly stated that they are in fact bones but they are if you squint you can get it i mean their names are boneville bones out of boneville <laughs> now i'm feeling stupid <laughs> anyways <laughs> That concludes our gravity. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Thanks for having me. The end of episode seven. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, like talk about something massively popular like uh, like the Amulet series. Really imaginative and, and fun. Like, yeah. Is that is what I guess, you know, it was powerful as in fun visuals. It kind of reminded me, I don't know, you guys should tell me. What, what is it about that that works or that has made it a bestseller or... Is it that kind of Dorito or what is, what are we talking about with what's special about the Amulet series? For us as an illustrator, is it, what do you think is, what's he, the strongest part of what he's got? World building definitely seems to be a big one with what I've, yeah. what I've heard from kids who have read it, things like that. The, I mean, and he's willing to throw anything in there from space to elves to, I mean, it's it kind of spider spans, bots, yeah, spider, spider bots. bots, robots to wizards. It, it's a little bit of everything, but I think. Nate, you might have a thought on this, but the the hook that has got people into that is a character who aspires to something that's positive. (laughs) So it's not a. It's just it's more geared along lines sort of a classic adventure story versus an inward psychological plunge. Yeah, I think I think it is a classic. Like it it is a classic hero's journey Mm. kind of a story that spans lots of settings and weirdness and yeah so what force just said about everything being incorporated into amulet anything could happen in amulet right and yet the architecture of the narrative is still very very classic gotcha it's not it's not a subversive or inverted narrative at all uh, and so i think because of that he has the freedom to go in very wild places because he's got that strong through backbone that resonates and re- has always resonated like it is it's like that that core narrative that that uh, readers have been wanting and young readers have been wanting forever they always yeah. want more of those and uh he's done a great job with it but that that series is actually interesting because forrest forrest worked on that series i did forrest I did. was a colorist on that series right i did on book eight and that's kind of one of the things that's interesting about big color graphic novels is that like tv shows they are teams and you know there's a strong there there is a creative personality at the center who's the boss and who's in charge and who's telling a story but it's a lot of people who work on those yeah can can you guys explain what's the the general workflow for those who are unfamiliar with how graphic novels are made i always assumed it was just a guy sat down and did it all in his room no unless you're jeff smith yeah sure guys i think i think even guys have done that (laughs) I mean, that's kind of the appeal to for a graphic, at least for me as a graphic novelist, is that instead of an animated feature, you don't need hundreds of people. You can do it with one or, you know, two or three, one if you're really lucky <laughs> or good or whatever. But you can you can craft a whole feature length project or style film. Sort so, of what's like workflow paper. for that? Workflow is, I mean, you start writing it. So, and that, and that varies depending on the creator. Some yeah. people start with scripts. Some people like to start- enable start by boarding it like they're actually just storyboarding the story that's how they create it others are it's prose and then gets translated into sketches and yeah would they draw it themselves or would they have someone who helps them draw it? they would ink pages they would go from okay gotcha sketches to final final illustrations that which they would ink mm-hmm. digitally usually yeah nowadays yeah and then they would hand it off to color teams and then the script would go do they type set the script or are they still write it by hand depends it varies it's weird. I mean, graphic novel scripts are weird. They're okay. weird. So, what do you what do you mean by that? Just because they don't, I assume people they, people there's there's no rules here. I, mean, I, don't, I don't think there should. Yeah, I don't think there should be. But a graphic novel script, you know, it will start with like page one, panel one, 
Yeah. You know, and then you describe what's in that panel and then write the dialogue for the characters in that panel. And then right. you can say like quarter page panel or splash panel. And mm-hmm. then you write what's in that panel mm-hmm. and then have the dialogue subsumed underneath that. And so then, then it's the next page, page two, mm-hmm. you insert a page break and page two is, you know, at the top is three equal sized panels. And so like somebody, somebody right. writing a script can end up calling out with massive specificity, the shape of every single panel on a page. And that's weird to me. Yeah, it is pretty strange. Uh, it, it makes sense if you're the one writing and illustrating versus like a film script where you have a lot yeah. of open-ended. Yeah, I actually, well, sure. But I, I, it feels to me like it doesn't make sense at all <laughs> to, <laughs> <Well, yeah. laughs> to call out the panels or anything like that. Tell the story and then have the artist board these scenes and these characters the way you would, it's it's weird. It'd, it'd be like writing a script for your prose where- oh, Okay, yeah. You know, a novel I, script. I feel yeah. like, okay, so at the bottom of this paragraph, have it be intense and at the top of this paragraph <laughs> and, and write that map. So tell the story. I, I want the script to tell the story and then have the artist then incarnate that story you know, with, with various structures. So we have a, Forrest and I are working on a graphic novel together, uh, an adaptation of 100 Cupboards. And you know, I, I started with screenplay format so yeah. that he would have you know, creative liberties with you know the storyboarding and then from there uh the publisher asked me to move it into graphic novel format which i did and it was super super weird but that was that was just to actually get the project sold and started and then now i can go back to a screenplay format and he can storyboard off of that so it's it is odd you know it's really really odd and having looked at the different kinds of script styles that people currently use, I don't understand. I know Kazoo for Amulet, I know there is no script. I know he yeah. just basically boards and boards and boards and, to, and throws stuff away, constantly boarding yeah. and throws it all away and shapes his, shapes his story that way. I know 10 April scripts. I'm sure other people script, but I don't know what their scripts necessarily look like. Because if it's, if it's an artist who's writing... I would assume they would be drawn to boarding it quickly and sooner. And if it's an author who's trying to write one, I would assume that they would way over specify, you know, a lot of the descriptions of what you're seeing on the page. Panel one, scene one, close yeah. up of Hobbit and the Hobbit hole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If we're going to, if we're going to be broader, we should probably should do this. Should you as a parent be concerned that your kid is reading too many graphic novels? The answer would be, well, if they are, sure. If it's, if too, it's really yeah. too many. If it's too actually many. too many. By definition. Yeah, yes. by definition. Yeah, you should be concerned. And which one? But yeah, exactly. But it, I think it is really healthy for kids to read broadly and to read across genres. And if there's one thing that we keep coming back to, it's that. that yeah. For sure. Let them read it if it's good. Yep. And then try to, and if they get stuck there. I mean, there was a time when I was little, when I started listening to uh, the audio Bible every single night. And... I had this big cassette set of the Bible and every single night I put in those tapes and I'd do like half an hour or an hour every night. <laughs> Which narrator? I don't remember. And I would recognize it though. And my parents, uh, my pastor father and my English teacher mother eventually banned it. No way. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> so in my home, I was forbidden for a while from listening to the Bible at night because they were worried that it was. Like, is he listening and engaging or is it a weird security blanket? Like, am I, am I, have I habituated myself to- He must only, have been a great narrator. Yeah. Have I, <laughs> habitu- have I habituated myself to only fall asleep if somebody's reading the Bible aloud? Is that what, is that what the Bible is to me? Moving into the sort of holy sleep zone. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, this is where I tune out and fall asleep. Yeah. <laughs> and okay. so, they, they banned it just to see, like, would I have trouble sleeping? Would I, what, what was going on? And I was like, okay, it was fine. But it's that kind of, like, even the Bible, like yeah. if, and I think that was a wise move of them to make sure that it wasn't getting weird for me. So if you have a kid who will only read graphic novels or is, you know, plowing through, uh, doesn't care, the baby bird that we talked about, I think we talked about in an early episode, like people yeah. who have no discernment, the baby bird who consumes anything, horrible graphic novels, good graphic novels, mediocre graphic novels, they don't care as long as it's not an actual novel. Like that's a problem. Yeah. But if you have a kid who won't read a graphic novel because they only read prose, you should make them. Like, get them a good one. Make them read it. 
broaden your imagination, be able to consume and engage with stories in different forms. Right. And with my son, it seemed that when we found a good one, it was something he would then read for hours. And you can see he's starting to get the the development right. to move on to a real book that would and, and now he is transferring. You know, it's stuff like early reader chapter books, but you yeah. know, he's starting to make that transfer and he sort of got the taste of what does it feel like to actually sit and read for a long time. And he got that from Yeah. You know. The pictures gave him the endurance. Right. Yeah. yeah. Which is nice. fine. So how how old is your oldest Forrest? Two. Two. And is she drawn to pictures and illustrations or does she want to hear stories? Uh, right now, she's hooked on Bill Pete, actually. <laughs> no, awesome. <laughs> Great pictures. He just, <laughs> his prose is way too long. So, I limit myself to a sentence a page and just make it up as I yeah, go. Yeah, because he has full, full like <laughs> 300 words per page. Yeah, right? it's, a, it's, a, it's too much. But you don't need it because the illustrations are so good. They can yeah, drive. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it depends. There's some stories that she likes because of the words, I think, but right now it's, we're big into pictures. There's, an, o- there's an ogre in one of them and uh, she's all about, she wants a stuffed ogre for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Lilius, yeah, her, her father's daughter for sure. Um, stuffed <laughs> ogre for a two-year-old girl. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay. What else do we need to cover on graphic novels? I think we should talk about some of our favorites. They don't need to be, you know, we don't need to like come up with some intense I am legend. top 10 list. That's your favorite graphic novel? Yep. I'm, I'm, I have been working through that for the last. Did it take you four months to read it's a graphic good. novel? Well, this one. <laughs> it's long. <laughs> We're not it long, is, it is just, long. It's, it's one of those ones that bounces. It kind of pushes the boundaries on both ends where you can have a whole yeah. paragraph of introspection and then a little bit of action and then, which is really fun. That is something about just the graphic novel as a medium that I think sometimes it gets a bad rap for is that. People think it's more like just watching a film. So, it's a passive engagement yeah. versus an active engagement, which is not true. It's just instead of, um, w- instead of your imagination working with words, you're just working with pictures. So, it's like you're, you're, given, you're given one image, a, a gap, and then another image. Say if it's a, a, a guy with a hat on in the first panel, and then the second panel is the guy with the hat off, your, your mind is working in the space between the panels. And so, you you're still have this active reader involvement. So, it's fun to see with like I Am Legend, for instance, you, you have some really interesting ways of sparking the imagination that you wouldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't get anywhere else, even with a film, I'd say. It's like, okay, so I've seen the film and I've read the original novel, Okay, but I, have, I don't know, like, what do you mean by that? Like, how could it be, how does it improve? Because it just, well, I don't know if improve is <laughs> the word. It's changes. different. Yeah. It changes because you're given images with the element of time introduced so the way it flows down the page just the composition of a page can give you a certain emotional punch or something like that you know so space like size of drawings how like how far apart are they are you you know what you're showing so it's it is a different language than yeah uh, okay does it compare it to the movie <laughs> <laughs> i think it's it makes me wonder about hieroglyphics you know in terms of yeah what did the egyptians see when they um, when they looked at that, like how did their imaginations work, and how were their imaginations trained to read in between, like Forrest is saying. So if I if I'm going through I Am Legend, then you see really effective use of white space in some ways, and I I don't mean that like literally just white space, but gaps, uh, use of emptiness, and that's the spaces where your imagination is working that Forrest is talking about. So you are you're going from this to this. And you're connecting. It's like you're you're running across water on lily pads. Like you know, it's just you have to get from here to there. And it, if done correctly, it requires the reader to do a lot of work, like right. to do a lot of creative engagement, a lot of work. And That's it's a not, lot of it's not passive. It's not passive at all. Mm. Uh, and unfortunately, there are I think there are tons of novels and graphic novels that are pretty passive. You know, they just really spoon feed it to you. And those are the weak ones, the ones that drag you into engagement and drag you into co-creation uh, the most, I think, are the strongest. Which is why bone is better in black and white. Than color. You yeah, give it less. Callback. <laughs> yeah. Callback. Okay. So, uh, those are adult, adult level. What about kid, kid level graphic novel? Hmm. I always say the same. I, only, I, I have not read that many graphic novels for being... Asterix I have Tintin looked at I have looked fun. at a lot of graphic novels, but yeah, the, I 
man, Tintin was big for me. I know, me too. And so I have a, I have the a one huge, I go back to every yeah, time. I have yeah. a huge amount of, fe- of affection for Tintin because I have a lot of gratitude, both affection and gratitude towards those books. And at the time, graphic novels were not a thing. Right. Like there wasn't a, it yeah. wasn't a distinction. People just thought, well, this is a comic. It's it wasn't just, even that. It was it was a Tintin. <laughs> yeah, it was a, yeah, it was its own thing. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Asterix. The Asterix comics were amazing, but I thought of them as comics. But they're through stories. Yeah, loved them. And Tintin was phenomenal. And in my childhood, were very difficult to find. I right. mean, they were not. These were not easy to find. So they were they were treasures. And there was no Amazon. Yeah, like you right. had to. The, no, no, uh, you'd fight over them in the library. There'd be like yeah. five copies in circulation. Yeah, and there and you'd look at the back and you'd see there are so many Tintin. I know where are they? <laughs> and, yet, and yet there's only Tintin in Tibet. Right. Like Tintin in Tibet is the only one in Moscow, Idaho right now. <laughs> right. Like, what's where are these other Tintins? On a trip with my family, we were in Annapolis, Maryland, and I walked into a store. There's not even a bookstore. It was a it had some books, but it was mostly like toys and, you know, souvenirs. And here's a little wheelie shelf of Tintins. And I was like, what <laughs> on earth? <laughs> And, gold mine. And yeah, exactly. Gold mine. I only had uh, limited funds in my pocket. And so I could only buy one and it was excruciating. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which one did you buy? Uh, King Otaker's Scepter. Nice. Oh, that's a great one. I wanted to, I still have it somewhere and it's pretty tattered, but uh, I wanted every single one of those Tintins on that, you know, Wheelie shelf. And then now we have my... It was really funny because when I when I bought every single Tintin for my children, when I was like, "We will have all the Tintins," yeah. <laughs> like done here, they here they all are. They all love them, but they aren't the same. They like really that, needed yeah. that supply and demand. That scarcity helped. Well, a that's lot. the thing is, I started collecting for my two year old daughter, and she likes Tintin in America because there's a crying baby in one panel <laughs> on the back, and that's all she cares about. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. but that, yeah, that, then I stopped because I thought. The scarcity, the hunt for the Tintin was such a big part of yeah. why it was so good. And obviously, they're great on their own. And I honestly, I honestly think that those, they, they scratch the same kind of itch that Indiana Jones does. You know, it's like, right. it's, it's really good at sparking imagination, not just engaging, engaging the reader with the imagination in the, this particular story, but sparking the reader's imagination about the world, about the history of the world, about different locations. It's awesome. I mean, they're really, really phenomenal. And- I know this is about books and reading, but the Canadian cartoons. Oh, are pretty good. Yeah. Solid. Canadian like, cartoons. You can only find them on YouTube, right? No, we have, I have, I found DVDs. Okay. Oh no. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. They were made in Canada. Yeah. I about that. Yeah. I have all of them. <laughs> yeah. And they're, and they're, they're pretty great. Yeah. They, they, they basically just use the, the exact comics same. as yeah. the boards and just one to one, which is so Awesome. Which is a, a flavor of adaptation. We could do use a little more of it. <laughs> yeah. It feels yeah. like when you watch yes. some, they didn't ruin it. Could you please just duplicate the experience as much as is possible? Right. <laughs> yeah. Has yeah. It's, so it's I think we unanimously landed on Tintin as basically the straight up best. I know. I just wondered if any if it had gotten better since my childhood, and 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 I mean, I really enjoyed. No, they've it. aged really well, and yeah. there's there's. Of course, ones that you have to say like, yeah, like these are the ones that have been cycled out of the canon because of racism, stereotypes, that kind of stuff. And some of that, you know, pretty, uh, I will think some of that is valid. <laughs> right. <laughs> because yeah. he was Belgian. Yep. And we uh, know what King Leopold. Yeah. And and we, we, know what those, we know what those Belgians did. So, while we forgive him for being Belgian because he did, he made a great comic, a great series of graphic novels he's still belgian and some of them and his breed of, of his breed of imperialism was pretty gross <laughs> <laughs> but who read who reads tintin in the congo anyways uh, yeah no one now you can't find it well yeah but the art's <laughs> terrible <laughs> yeah, the art's bad he hadn't landed on his final right. yeah. design so yeah the art's bad everything's bad skip that one get all the other ones the soviet tintin one is pretty funny too <laughs> <laughs> yeah you could tell he was finding his speaking voice. back to publishers they're desperately trying to codify everything like 1010 Alphard is the newest one that came out which is yeah. literally his sketches tried to assemble into a book form and i it, also have that it's fun yeah but you're trying to use every part of the buffalo right even so, the green wobbly bit so yeah for adults <laughs> i like i am legend and for kids 10 10 10 10 right. 10 10 yeah in first second and third place we already mentioned amulet it's great i love cardboard if yeah if you have kids yeah. who really are needing a kick in the imagination pants 10 april's great uh cardboard bad island yeah 
Ghostopolis. Ghost, yeah, Ghostopolis, but Tommy Soros Rex. Like, yeah, for some, something about, I think the dead pet in Bad Island was one of those Im- imaginative hooks that got all my kids into it. The she dead has, snake. She has a dead snake like the little girl does, and, and my kids were in for, <laughs> for the whole story as soon as they found the dead snake, you know? <laughs> yeah. I think there's a lesson there. But Tenable, one of the things that's fun about Tenable is that you, when you're reading, you absolutely cannot trust him. And it's, <laughs> he, he might be the most unreliable uh, creator that you'll ever encounter, meaning you don't know what's going to happen oh, yeah. when you turn that page. So, there's a lot of people who get into a steady rhythm and you can trust them. Like, it'll all be okay. It'll all be fine. It, it, this won't involve, you know, some very, very wild strangeness uh, on the next page that then is cataclysm, cataclysmically awful for right. your character. So I, I, I do kind of like the wild card nature of Tenable because I can't anticipate. Yeah. And there's, there's downsides to that. There's weaknesses to that. And so when it, go, when it goes wrong, it goes wrong in particular ways. And there's other ways in which that's just a lot more fun. It's a lot more fun to be turning the page and not knowing yeah. what's, what's coming. I think with the graphic, sure. the graphic novel, the ability to turn that page and see what's next, I think that might be the feeling of a graphic novel that, you know, it, it kind of reduces the excitement of story grip on every single, every flip in a way that like a novel can't do or even, you know, it even feels like sometimes a movie. I mean, a movie can do that with a quick cut, but yeah. I think the graphic novel imitates that really well. I think we landed on a really good conclusion, which is that you should buy all your children all the Tintins. Yeah. And I'm, I'm still, I'm sitting here thinking like, what else? And I can never, I mean, I know that asterisk as, as a media, yeah, asterisk is, uh, as a medium that those were like, there's so much potential, yep. at least for the best Dorito. But yeah. uh, it's been a while since anything as good as Tintin has yeah. been made. Yep. Well, there we there go. We I think go. that's where we let it land. I think we did. Tintin. Graphic novels. Forget are, graphic novels. Read Tintin. Right. <laughs> Pictures with beginning, middle, and end. We got it. We don't care how it's bound. Right. As long as it's Tintin. As long as there are, I think yeah, there are 32 Tintins legit. for each of your children, right? Something like that. They can share them. So there we go. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Cool. So, well, this has been episode seven. We have thoroughly engaged with graphic novels. Don't ever let the topic be discussed again. I think the we, definitive I think podcast on the graphic definitive novels. full stop discussion we've plumbed novels. the depths there's yep. nothing else to say perfect there we go cut thanks for listening to this week's edition of the stories are soul food podcast before you go if you haven't heard of indy wilson's hunter covered series i wanted to introduce you to the very first book 12 year old henry york is going to sleep one night when he hears a bump on the attic wall above his head It's an unfamiliar house. Henry is staying with his aunt and uncle and three cousins. So he tries to ignore it. But the next night he wakes up with bits of plaster in his hair. Two knobs have broken through the wall and one of them is slowly turning. Henry scrapes the plaster off the wall and discovers doors. 99 cupboards of all different sizes and shapes. Through one he can hear the sound of falling rain. Through another he sees a glowing room with a man strolling back and forth. Henry and his cousin, Henrietta, soon understand that these are not just cupboards. They are, in fact, portals to other worlds. Hundred Cupboards is the first book in this fantasy adventure written in the best world-hopping tradition and reinvented in Indy Wilson's own inimitable style. Find Hundred Cupboards today at canonpress.com or wherever you get your books.